how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure it's this. Hey, the Dapper Dinosaur here. You may have noticed I look a little different. That's because it's October, and so this is my Halloween look, because as far as I'm concerned, October is Halloween. So, recently, Kent Hovind made some videos about the age of the Earth, or the universe, and how we can measure distances to stars. So let's take a look at that. Now, parallax and measure distance measurement. How do they measure the distance to a star? Well, that rather depends on what star we're talking about. If it's a relatively nearby star, then parallax will work, but if it's far enough away, we may have to use things like standard candles to get an estimate as to how far away things in its vicinity are. Well, they're pretty far away. Yes, they are far away. When somebody says, that star is, you know, 18.7 billion light years away, I say, now how did you measure that? Was it a Lufkin, a Stanley, or a Craftsman? And who held the other end of that ruler? I want to meet that guy. Yeah. Science is silly because it measures things you can't measure with a ruler. Oh, let's see. Parallax is the apparent displacement of an object because of a change in the observer's point of view. Astronomers can measure a star's position once and then again six months later and calculate the apparent change in position. Why six months later? Well, it's because Earth's orbit around the Sun, we've gone six months around the Sun. That's a big circle. Hey, Kent basically got that right. That is how parallax measurements are taken. You wait six months, and that way the Earth is on the other side of the orbit. That's the largest amount of distance that you can reliably get on Earth to measure parallax to distant objects in the sky. Good job, Kent. Okay, at 66,000 miles an hour. The star's apparent motion is called stellar parallax. The distance d is measured in parsecs. What is that? Well, I'll show you in a minute. And the parallax angle p is measured in arc seconds. Okay, there are 3,600 parsecs in a degree. Normally I wouldn't consider this to be really that big of a deal, but Kent Hovind throughout this video consistently calls arc seconds parsecs. In fact, he even had the word arc seconds up on his screen, so there's really no excuse for this, but it's very consistent. What? One degree? You take a circle has 360 degrees in it. Each one of those degrees is divided up into 3600 slices. That's a parsec. Here's how we arrive at parsecs as a unit of distance. One parsec is the distance to an object whose parallax angle is one arc second. Okay? Here is a protractor, right? They're telling me we take one degree and divide that up into 3,600 slices. Would you agree those would be fairly skinny slices? A human typically has a field of view of about 120 degrees. So, yes, one arc second compared to that would be extremely tiny but a telescope might have a field of view of only a few hundred arc seconds, in which case, no, it's not very tiny. And it would make the displacement of something like, say, Proximate Centauri at approximately 1.3 parsecs away very noticeable. It would have a 1.3 arc second displacement when measured six months apart. If your field of view is very tiny, then a tiny difference will be very noticeable. I'm sorry that Kent apparently can't think in terms of scale, Kind of like a flat earther. That's a parsec. I would say real skinny. How to calculate the distance? They use the parallax angle by looking at a star between two photos taken six months apart. Now keep in mind, we're moving. How many have ever been on a tilt a whirl? You ever been on one of those things? You sit in the chair, the chair is spinning. But it's also with a cluster of other chairs that is spinning, and it's on a platform that the whole thing is spinning, right? So not only are you spinning, there's three different things you got to account for. Suppose I said, I want you to sit on this tilt-a-whirl. While it is going, I want you to measure how fast that car is driving down the street. Rotation is usually measured in something like rotations per minute, where one rotation per minute means that the object rotates 360 degrees in the course of one minute. Well, how fast does the Earth rotate in rotations per minute? Oh, 0.006 rotations per minute? I feel like if I were on a tilt-a-whirl rotating at 0.006 rotations per minute, 
I feel like I might be able to get an accurate assessment of how fast the truck was going based on me being essentially stationary. Well, now, you got quite a few things to take keep track of here. Your spin on the chair, the chair's spin on its little circle, and the whole thing spinning on the big circle. So you're telling me you can take a position on a spinning Earth, which is going around the sun, and that is going around the galaxy, and the galaxy is going around the universe, and from those, all those moving points, you're going to calculate a distance to something. This all sounds so familiar. Where have I heard this before? Oh, no, no, not a flashback, no! The motion and blazing speed of the Earth. The actual motion, speed, and unbelievable movement of the Earth in the accepted heliocentric model of the solar system says we are spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the equator. Now that's only one revolution per day, but we're also zooming 66,000 miles per hour around the sun. But how about the entire Milky Way, which includes the Earth and the sun, as together we are racing around the great attractor at 2.2 million miles per hour. That's 52,800,000 miles per day and 19,272,000,000 miles per year. Oh, that was Gerinism. A flat earther. Talking about how ridiculous all these speeds are. Why is Kent sounding like a flat earther? Well, that's about as much Kent as I can take for right now. In other news, I started a Patreon. If you really like what I do, and you're feeling generous, head on over there. I currently have several tiers. For $1, you can be a tetrapod and join my Discord. At $5, you can be an amniote and get included in the credits to my episodes. At $10, you can be a seropsid and you can join the Discord server, still get the credits, and you get a better role in the Discord server that allows you to do more things. At $20 for diapsid, your name will be included in the credits. I will also thank you personally out loud in the end credits, and you get an even better Discord role. At $50 for Archosaur, you will be named out loud in the credits. Your name will be in the credits. You have almost complete moderator control over the Discord, but you can't kick people or invite them. And you can make a video request, and I will do my best to get that video out as soon as you make it. At $100 or more, you can be a dinosaur. You will have the best Discord role there is, including preferential speaker, so when you start speaking in the Discord, it will quiet everyone else. You can also get two video requests, and I will send you a digital file containing a 3D model for my Ceratosaurus. Also, I will occasionally be asking for patrons to vote on topics for new videos, or videos to cover, and every successive tier gets twice as many votes as the one below it. So at Tetrapod, you only get one vote, but you can get all the way up to 32 votes at Dinosaur. Well, thanks for watching. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.